Hi, welcome to JJ Atkins Art. Today we're going to be taking a look at a two-parter based on Bill Lumberg from Office Space. Now, if you're unfamiliar, Office Space was a movie that came out in the 90s, kind of a parody on the kind of cubicle mentality of, of the workplace environment. And, you know, uh, uh, Bill Lumberg here, one of the one of the characters in this uh, movie, uh, is definitely something of a, a perfect example of, of 90s nostalgia with, with his, you know, oversized dress shirts and the suspenders and weird pattern ties and everything kind of matchy-matchy. And, and if I'm going to offer a little confession here, I will let you know, I definitely embraced that lifestyle myself in the 90s. I, I worked in the kind of cubicle farm mentality and wore similar type of outfits with a shirt and tie and you know all that good stuff but I, I digress we're, we're here to talk about the drawing so let's go ahead and get into it so what we're going to start off with today is just part one of a two-parter uh, the part one here is going to focus on the line drawing and then a later video part two is going to get into the coloring and the rendering of light and shadow I, i've done a couple of uh, other videos in the similar fashion before they seem to be kind of popular as i broke down the method into a lot of detail and, and it's kind of necessary if we want to get into this level of detail so if, if you like it and, you, and you're happy with what's happening here go ahead and give me a like or even more importantly leave me a comment let me know if you have any questions about anything that's happening here and and in future videos, I could try to go into a little bit more detail if needed. So first things first, um, the caricature. Now, Bill Lumberg is a caricature in and of himself. The, the character is very comedic. He comes from a comedy type movie, so that makes sense. So exaggerating his features uh, really kind of came in a couple of different areas. Number one, the actual line drawing itself, the, 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 the lines that say this is the resemblance of the person we're looking for. But also we're trying to invoke a little bit of character here as well. Now, the character of Bill Lumberg is kind of a smarmy kind of guy. Uh, what I mean by that is that he's very, very casual in the way that he says things, but he's almost a little bit devious in the way that he kind of manipulates people as well. So the pose, the, the stance that he has as he puts his arm over this little cubicle wall here was very, very important. And it started with something of a gesture drawing to make sure that I got the spine in that kind of curve that we're looking for here. Uh, I obviously use some reference photos for this. Th this pose happens in the movie over and over and over again as he continually comes back, leans his arm on a cubicle wall and has some sort of ridiculous conversation. Again, it happens several times. It's something of the, the comedy genius of it. But... Getting these reference photos is really important to try to mimic in the drawing that kind of lackadaisical pose, that 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 kind of uh, uh, lean in that he does on that cubicle wall. The body pose on this was relatively easy to get once I kind of understood the gesture, the the, the, the kind of again curve in the spine. Uh, to show that his weight is kind of leaning on the cubicle wall came pretty easily from the get-go. So once I had that, I set it aside, kind of hid the layer so I could spend some time focusing on the face. That was really where a lot of the indecision kind of comes up, at least for me and a lot of the caricature work that I do. Traditionally speaking, uh, the body poses tend to be just something I kind of sketch out really, really quickly because they're not nearly as important as trying to catch the resemblance in the face itself. Now, your mileage may vary on that. As I said, we're drawing character as much as we are caricature here. But, I, again, I digress. I want to focus here a little bit on the face as we get into this portion of the line drawing. And because we're talking about caricature here, what we're really kind of implying is exaggeration. And what part of the face we're going to exaggerate here is kind of up for debate a little bit. So, when it comes to the uh, planning stages of how you're going to, you know, go about your exaggeration, I usually start with a couple of rough sketches of the face, just to try to get an idea of where I'm gonna focus on the uh, resemblance piece and what parts of this I'm gonna kind of exaggerate and what parts I'm gonna kind of try to leave alone. I know for a fact here that this is again a very comedic, very cartoonish type personality that the actor is playing here, but my art style tends to lend itself more towards photorealistic slash comic book versus just straight out cartoon. Um, and, and in that, when I do my exaggeration, I, I don't necessarily go enormously overboard. I don't really stretch or push the envelope like some caricature artists do because I find that I don't get necessarily as much success out of it as some others do when it comes to trying to capture the resemblance. Now, again, your mileage may vary on that, but what I'm saying here in the nutshell here is I started out going with some extreme exaggeration, and then as I kind of decided what parts I wanted to keep and what parts I wanted to redraw, I scaled it back a little bit until we get to the final version that we'll end up with at the end of this piece. But right now what you're seeing is just, again, that experimentation phase, that idea of I have some ideas of what I want to experiment, but I'm not sure what it's going to look like on paper yet, so let's just see what happens. We'll delete whatever we don't want, we'll start over when necessary, and eventually we'll hone in on where this thing is 
is supposed to be. Now, I think this is a really good practice for anybody that's doing caricature work, or at least trying to start doing caricature work, because this idea that you're going to nail it first time out of the gate every time is something that we want to kind of strive for. But if this is something you're starting in, and I, I'm one of those people, I, I'm really kind of experimenting with caricature, I don't necessarily get it from the first time out of the gate, even though I have some really good ideas in my head as to what this might look like when it's all said and done. For instance, I happen to know just from looking at, you know, pictures of, uh, of the actor here and, and scenes from the movie and just my own memories of it, that Lumberg is just kind of a tall, skinny kind of guy. So that immediately found its way into the caricature, the elongated face. But you have to kind of get a little bit more detailed with this, or at least a little bit more conscious of, of, of the detail. Here's what I'm getting at. You can't just stretch out everything and expect that to be the caricature. It just doesn't quite capture the resemblance that you're looking for if, if that's your goal. So what I usually do is I start at the eye line. If I'm looking at my, my reference photograph and I'm trying to decide where I want to start with the character, I want to start, generally speaking, with the shape of the head. And you can see me kind of experimenting with that right now. But again, I'm starting at the eye line there when I begin the drawing. And, and what I mean by that is that with the eye line, I kind of divide the head in half, top half and lower half. And the first judgment call I make is whether or not the, the top is going to be bigger than the lower half or the lower half is going to be bigger than the top half. And that's really, again, a good place to start if this is something new to you. So if you look at your reference photograph and you say, hey, this forehead is really small compared to this large jawline, then you know what to exaggerate. You know to kind of tip everything in terms of its balance to the lower half of the face and shrink the top half to kind of balance everything out. Or, you know, vice versa if, if that's the other case. Now, <clears throat> Bill Lumberg here, at least the actor that plays him, has a very, very long jaw, very, very long lower half of the face. But it's easy to miss because he has an enormous amount of hair up on the top of his head. And again, you don't want to exaggerate everything. You can't just make everything big and just think that you've got a caricature there. You're going to lose your resemblance really quick. So trying to find that good, and I hate to use this word again, but balance between exaggerating the size of the hair on the top of his head and the size of the jaw below the uh, eye line, it's, it's something of a temperamental thing. And then that's where these experimental drawings really kind of help out. I kind of failed at capturing the resemblance a few times, even though I felt I got close. And so in this last attempt here, although, the, uh, uh, excuse me, this may not be the last attempt, but in this next attempt here, I tried to really kind of block everything out as photorealistically as I possibly could. So if I was taking a look at this reference drawing and I was trying to reproduce it as literally as I possibly could without exaggeration, where would my, my lines kind of end up at? Where would my eye line end up at? Where would my mouth line end up at? And etc. And because I kind of, you know, fumbled around a couple of times, didn't really kind of strike gold after the first few attempts, this kind of more photorealistic take helped me out in trying to determine where uh, some of the proportions could be exaggerated and which ones I was kind of ignoring up until now. I kept focusing on the glasses, thinking that the glasses had to be really, really big to capture the resemblance or at least to, to, to get the ridiculousness of the caricature out there. But... Ultimately, what I ended up deciding was the glasses really were kind of a, uh, a red herring, so to speak, or, or a dead end. Um, just because somebody wears glasses doesn't mean it's the first thing to exaggerate. And I think it's a really good lesson to learn there. Ultimately, the glasses had to be incorporated, but I didn't really emphasize them as much as I, as I emphasized some other things, like the extremely lower uh, uh, portion of the mouth there. That you know, space between the bottom of the nose and the top of the lip is absolutely enormous. And I exaggerated it quite a bit to get the effect that I was looking for. And mostly because that jawline was so extended as well. If you look at reference photographs of, uh, of Bill Lumberg from that movie, you'll see that, that, you know, from the bottom of his ear down to the tip of his chin, there's just an enormous amount of space going on there. And once I realized that's really where a lot of the exaggeration had to lie, then everything kind of above it had to be shrunken down at least a little bit, if not more, in order to, to create that sense of balance that we're looking for. Now, um, I use a, uh, a brush initially that, that mimics something of a pencil, so that way I can get really sketchy and loose in my drawings. And as I put layer and layer over top of it, I kind of refine the drawing and get a little bit more detail as I go along. And at this point, decisions are going to be made, like, you know, exactly what shape does the nose take, as opposed to just, you know, a, uh, a triangle that I'd used as a placeholder before. Same with the, same with the eyes. You know, uh, when I'm just kind of roughing something in, I'll just put in a line or a couple of dots to represent the eyes. But a lot of the resemblance uh, uh, that you're trying to capture in these caricatures come from the eyes and the nose and that general just T area that, that those uh, two things make. So 
once I'm getting into the final stages of the line drawing here and deciding uh, uh, you know, where everything is really going to kind of take its final place, eyes become very important. And that means making sure that they're in the right place of the face, that they're the right size, and that you have certain subtleties built in there like what do the eyelids look like. You know, some people, the eyelids get very much hidden underneath the brow. And in other cases, people have, you know, more, uh, maybe a lazy eye syndrome where, where their eyes are maybe half closed. Some people have bags under their eyes representing some sense of age or wisdom or something like that. And again, these little decisions that, that you put in these little teeny tiny detail the line work around the eyes. And, you know, again, also in the shape of the nose as well, really are where you kind of get that resemblance of the figure that you're looking for. So if we're looking at Bill's nose here, notice how pointed it is and that there's almost like a flatness to the upper portion of it. I almost kind of think of it almost like a ski slope, right? From the bottom edge of the uh, glasses leading all the way to the tip of his nose, that thing is one solid flat ramp. And again, this is coming directly from the reference photo. Uh, in the reference photo I'm using here, and we'll see in the final color stages, the light source um, from, from the roof above him, from the ceiling above him, lights up that kind of ramp shape of his nose so much that it's almost entirely white. And when we go in to put in our light and painting a little bit later on, we'll see how important it is that, that that flat shape is kind of rendered in the pencil drawing early on. That literal shape is going to be one of the things that lets you take a look at it and say from the get-go, that's lumber. Now, mouth is also important as well. I have heard a lot of caricature artists argue that the, the hardest thing to kind of capture in terms of the resemblance is the mouth. Eyes and nose, a lot of people tend to focus on, but the mouth, make a mistake there, and you've kind of lost the resemblance. And so uh, you'll see that a little bit later on, I spent a lot of time messing around with the mouth, mostly in deciding where I wanted to kind of place it. I knew that that, you know, kind of upper lip from, from you know, the bottom part of the nose to the upper portion of the lip had an enormous amount of space there. I was exaggerating it, but the question became how much to exaggerate it. Move it too far away from the bottom of the chin, again, you lose the resemblance. Move it too close to the bottom of the chin, you lose the resemblance all over again. So the beauty of working in something of a digital program like Procreate is being able to say, okay, now I've gotten to this part where I'm ready to draw the mouth and I'm going to put it in its own separate layer so that way I have the ability to move it around and kind of make some final judgment calls where I want to place it. And now that I have some sort of an idea as to how I want that head to look, the next step was to bring back the body and, uh, you know, kind of stitch everything together. Now, you may have noticed here that because I kept everything on separate layers, the head and the body don't match anymore. So it became necessary to redraw the, bad, the, the body, especially the neck and the shoulders, to match up with the placement and the kind of the turn of the head. When I originally drew the rough sketch for this, the, uh, the idea was to have the head, you know, looking at you straight on. But I try to stay away from that as much as I can. These kind of three-quarter views or three-quarter turn of the head poses tend to make it a little bit easier to capture resemblance. And so I try to go there if I can. Straight on profiles or, or straight on looking forward towards the camera sometimes can work depending on who you're trying to draw. But generally speaking, the three-quarter view seems to work a lot better or at least maybe a little bit easier. So uh, once we got the rough sketch in of, the, of the, uh, the head and the neck and the shoulder line there, the rest of it is really just kind of drawing over what I'd already put in before. Little things like the tie are really kind of easy to put in because they're not going to um, you know, draw a lot of attention, number one. And number two, they're really just some very basic shapes. And maybe this is just because of who I am and the world I grew up in, but I spent every day for the better part of 10 or 15 years wearing a tie to work every single day. So drawing one wasn't really all that tough because I'm very, very familiar with what these things look like. On the other hand, uh, the hands were a lot of fun as well because hands are something I typically tend to struggle with. Uh, you know, I, I kind of grew up in a world where I drew a lot of cartoons. You know, I, I, I drew a lot of Disney stuff, but also a lot of Simpsons stuff and Ninja Turtles and things like that growing up. And the thing that a lot of these characters have in common is that they're usually missing a finger. A lot of, a lot of cartoons only do the three finger and a thumb type method. And I kind of grew up learning how to draw with that three finger method. It made things a lot easier. But when you want to start doing some more realistic stuff and you have to add in a fourth finger, it almost seems like your hands are almost always too big or there's just not enough space to squeeze in all those sausage fingers that you're trying to get in there. So I, I, I will say that I struggle with hands, but the thing about it is that the struggle has gotten to be a little bit fun for me because it's almost like solving a puzzle. I, I um, have seen artists that don't struggle with hands. I've seen artists that struggle with hands and the way that they deal with it is just to try to hide them. And I've 
been guilty of that myself, uh, quite a bit as a matter of fact. So I don't want to kind of put any shame on it. It's, it's a legitimate method if you can pull it off and pull it off well. But I've kind of gotten to the stage of my art where I'm just kind of tired of hiding from that stuff and I want to learn. And so I spend some time sketching hands when I'm just doodling and stuff like that. But when it comes to pieces like this, I'm just going to get in there and I'm just going to kind of dive in and fight the fight. Draw that hand, draw it over and over and over again. Get reference photos up as much as you possibly can. And, and to be frank here, that this pose that I'm doing of Lumberg isn't really specific to any one particular picture. I had about 10 different reference photographs from him and I didn't really draw any one specific version of him as much as it was something of a mix of all the different poses that were similar but a little bit different in various scenes throughout the movie. So in some of the scenes, his, his one hand might rest a little bit different on the cubicle wall or hold the cup of coffee in a slightly different position. And again, I didn't really kind of rely on one particular photograph here, but something of a mixture of all of them to get the, the specific look and the, uh, the light and shadow effect that I was looking for here. So when it came time to draw the hands, I did have some loose reference to take a look at. Uh, for instance, for the ring on his uh, right hand there, I really needed to kind of get a zoom in on one on his very, very specific picture that I had of him so I could try to get that ring as accurate as I possibly could. And, and for the record, it looks to be like some sort of like a, a class ring from either high school or college. Um, so having a, a kind of identify what it was, it, it made it a little bit easier to render. But the fingers and then the specific placement of the hand on the cubicle wall, that's something that had to be somewhat invented. And as a result, there, there needed to be some experimentation to make sure I got the hand right. So you see another example of it here. I've kind of got the mug roughed in right now. And what I'm doing is I'm drawing in some just basically loose rectangles to represent where the fingers are going to lie on the mug. One of the great things about the reference was finding out that Blumberg doesn't necessarily get all four fingers inside that handle on the mug, only the first two. So that actually made it a little bit easier to draw, realizing that I didn't have an enormous amount of fingers to squeeze into a very tiny space. And because he holds his mug like that, I was able to get use those reference photographs to be able to get a better representation of what the hand does look like with its shadows and lights and you know ultimately pull off what I think at the end of this piece is a pretty successful well rendered three dimensional type hand. Um, the line drawing certainly helps inform this but but it's really the color and the light and the shadow that really kind of sell it as, as the physical three dimensional hand that I want it to look like. Uh, when, when we get into the coloring in the next video, we'll talk about the mug and the handle in a little bit more detail. But the last thing I'm going to kind of say on it is that I do employ a method here with a lot of my drawings where I tend to draw hands separately from the body. And it's because I'm trying to get that hand to look exactly the way that I want it to look. And once I'm happy with it, then I'll use the, um, the program to move it into place. And once I've got it in place, then I will connect hand to shoulder through just a couple of lines representing the upper arm and the, and the forearm. So essentially, I, I kind of play like a connect the dots type mentality. Get the hand in place, figure out where your shoulder's gonna be, and then connect, connect the dots with a couple of lines and draw the arm around that. I find this works really helpful, uh, or I find this to be really helpful when it comes to foreshortening. So a lot of the figures that I draw tend to have some sort of a foreshortened arm because one of the hands is coming towards you. The forearm holding the cup of coffee is an example of this. That forearm is, ex is in perspective and extremely foreshortened and would have been very difficult to eyeball it if I was just drawing everything as I went along. Because I drew the hand first and I knew I had to play that connect the dot mentality, then I was able to easily see, or at least a little bit easy, more easily see, how foreshortened that forearm had to be. Because at some point or another, there's gotta be an elbow and I know that you know the uh, upper arm comes into the elbow at a certain point, and then at the other point, I gotta connect elbow to wrist, and if there's not much space to do that, then it's gotta be extremely uh, foreshortened or an extreme perspective. This is something you'll see a lot in comic books. Uh, when you watch, uh, uh, or excuse me, when you see comic book uh, uh, drawings of say like Superman flying towards the camera, a lot of times his feet will be really tiny or just not even seen at all, but his fists may be enormous and cover like half the page just because of that extreme perspective. So I'm kind of employing that methodology here a little bit, but I'm not exaggerating as much as you would see in a comic book because I'm going for more of that photorealistic effect. So tying everything together here. At this point, I've got several different pieces of this picture on several different layers, and I wanted to make sure that I had a really good, well-established line drawing before I move on to coloring. It's just something of my method. Um, I also wanted to take some time in my pencil drawing to get some ideas of where the bigger, more bold shadows were gonna be. So for instance, uh, the suspender 
that's uh, sitting over top of the hand holding the cup of coffee, it buckles a little bit because of the stance that he's sitting in. And there's a large, bold shadow right underneath it where the suspender kind of comes away from his chest and then torso. Uh, you know, just about an inch or so. But that big, bold shadow is there to remind me to make sure that I paint it in later because if I don't, that suspender is going to look really funky. It's not going to look like it's coming off the body or buckling the way that it does naturalistically. Now, the same thing with the line coming off the tie there. It may look like it's a mistake. This little you know, line that kind of comes off the tie and, and kind of comes up towards the uh, upper shoulder there. It is there on purpose. That's meant to be a wrinkle in the shirt. And even though that doesn't look great right now, when I put in shadow and light a little bit later on, that line's gonna be something of a reminder that I wanted a wrinkle in the shirt there, which is appropriate considering, again, this idea that his arm is lifted up a little bit and sitting on top of that cubicle wall. Similar, uh, you know, things are going to have to uh, take place as well with the underside of the hair there. So you can see I'm putting in some dark uh, uh, shadow areas underneath that kind of a uh, uh, kind of comb over or that kind of whip over the, of the longer portions of the hair near the forehead. Um, same thing with inside the mouth. That's going to be very black, but I want to make sure I understood where the lower teeth were going to be. Every single picture that I found of Lumberg with his mouth open talking had no teeth showing at all, except for that little bit of the lower row right there. So again, if I'm seeing it over and over and over again, it's got to get in there. It's part of the character. It's part of the personality. Um, the uh, funny thing about this is, is that the more I looked at reference photos of him, the less I saw eyebrows. Um, it's not that they didn't exist. It's that he was wearing glasses that were so large that a lot of the times uh, his eyebrows were hidden behind the frames of the eyeglasses. He also has some slightly recessed eyes with some big shadows in there. The glasses probably exaggerate that a little bit. So those dark shadows can also uh, be mistaken for the eyebrows, or rather the eyebrows can blend into those dark shadows and, and appear almost like they're missing. So I did push in some really, really thick, bold eyebrows into this just because he looked a little bit weird without eyebrows. But if I'm being honest, a lot of the pictures, you, you could barely see eyebrow at all. So just a little bit of an artistic license taken that I think uh, I worked in this particular sense. Got the body down, got the face down, got my hands where I want. Now it's time to work on the background. And the background is something that was also in an extreme perspective. Uh, something, I, again, I took very much off reference photographs. So I did simplify the background a little bit, um, but, but the idea of putting it in an extreme perspective with the ceiling and the floor kind of showing on the right-hand side comes directly from a reference photo, I guess, believe it or not. So I, I kind of feel like if a camera that, that's you know depicting a reality on a, on a movie screen is showing that extreme perspective, then I will as well. And I didn't really like it at first, but the more I got the painting and the final rendering in, the more it kind of seemed to work especially once I got the shadows in and it kind of seemed like Lumberg was really kind of sitting truly in that environment. Again, like, we'll get into more of that when we get into the coloring phase in, in part two of the video, but uh, we can kind of start uh, getting back to the line work here by kind of talking about this final version of our line work. So what I'm doing here is just taking all those rough sketches, I kind of put them together into one layer and used it as the template for my final inks. Uh, again, this goes back to something of a comic book type mentality. It's, it's kind of how I grew up and learned to draw was kind of that pen and ink toward a meet, uh, sort of media. And so when I do the, uh, the ink work here, what I'm kind of saying is I'm laying in final lines as to what I want this final composition to be. So Lumberg here has got his you know head tilted a little bit, his body's in something of a rested casual position. And if you're familiar with the movie, this is very, very uh, similar to, to the way that he uh, kind of acts and, and behaves in, throughout the movie. But this final line work, what I'm doing here is just trying to establish where I ultimately want my color bound boundaries to be. So when we get into the color phase of this, this is going to be broken up into multiple layers again. There'll be a background layer that represents kind of the office around him. And then in front of that will be his torso. Then in front of that, his head. And as a matter of fact, I think I ended up doing head and torso in the same uh, same uh, layer. But his two hands are also in their own layers. So the hand on the cubicle wall is its own layer, and the hand holding the mug is its own layer. And then the cubicle wall itself, a layer by itself. And there's also going to be a little bit of detail work later on. There's going to be a piece of paper tacked to the uh, cubicle wall, and that will be the uh, layer that sits the most in the foreground. Doing it like this really just helps capture some of the shadows uh, uh, and create a, something of a depth in your piece. Because for instance, I can shadow that torso as much as I want, especially around that tie area where that coffee mug sits. And I can put it in there and make sure that it's consistent shadow throughout the entire torso without having to worry about painting around the mug that's kind of overlapping it. Because the mug is on its own layer, I can paint everything underneath of it, paint shadow underneath of it. And when I get to the mug layer, 
and add its light and shadow, it will create something of a, a sense of depth and give you that idea that the mug is sitting in a three-dimensional space with the body or the torso behind it. Um, I, I, I don't know that this is a kind of bragged statement or anything like that, but I do often get compliments on the amount of depth I'm able to achieve with some of my final renderings, and this is kind of how I do it. Keeping certain things or different layers because, that, uh, because it's kind of simulating the depth and using consistent shadows on those various layers to help keep that separation and that contrast so that things push forward, things sit back, and hopefully achieve that, that, that illusion of three dimensions that ultimately I think is like the goal of every piece that I try to do. I don't like flat things. I want them to be as three-dimensional as possible in my work, and so I really try to push that, that, that envelope of depth as much as I possibly can, and that, that's just kind of one of the ways I try to achieve it. Uh, one of the other ways I try to achieve it gets into like filters and things like that, but again, this is getting into coloring, so we'll address that in the next video. Now, um, one thing I'd like to point out here while we're kind of finishing up the line drawing is that I was inspired to do this piece for a couple different reasons. Uh, number one, there's a nice little uh, kind of tagline that's going to come in the air, uh, come in the end. Uh, you probably already saw at the beginning, uh, kind of mocking his, his one of his famous quotes, uh, basically saying, you know, oh, I'm going to need you to uh, subscribe. Uh, so please take a moment to subscribe. It really helps me out. This is a very, very small, humble channel, but I am very earnestly looking for an audience out there and assuming that one exists, you know, let me know what you'd like to see because I, I would like to get some new fresh ideas and some drawings you'd like to see or any or address any questions or concerns you may have about how this rendering is done. But the other thing I think that bears some mentioning here, which I think is just really kind of entertaining, is that um, the guy that created the Office Space movie is named Mike Judge. And Mike Judge is also the creator of Bill and, uh, excuse me, uh, Beavis and Butthead. And uh, I grew up, again, watching Beavis and Butthead on MTV as well. And so I always kind of like had a certain amount of respect for Mike Judge in the sense that he's a brilliant comedic talent. He's, a, he's an excellent writer as far as that's concerned. But you know, the Beavis and Butthead cartoons had characters in there that almost identically showed up again in the Office Space movie, and I always kind of thought that was kind of funny. The uh, the character, uh, I think his name is uh, Milton, if I'm not mistaken, the guy with the, uh, the stapler, is there's almost a literal uh, uh, version of him in the Beavis and Butthead cartoons, and so you can kind of see that, that, that translation coming over where Mike Judge has ideas that he kind of carries over from one project to the next. Um, I, I think it's a sh uh, you know kind of a shade of brilliance there. I really enjoy his work. I love his comedy. Again, I grew up in that kind of office space mentality when I was a little bit younger in the corporate world. I'm kind of still in the corporate world today, but it's it just kind of in a different kind of role. But the point of the matter here is that, you know, I, I live that office space mentality. So I, I always knew it to be a brilliant comedy, even though it didn't do very well at the box office. And I've seen it several dozen times. Now, as a matter of fact, uh, just to give you a little preview of what's to come, uh, you know, Lumberg was, was an absolute joy to do. But when I told some friends that I was working on something with office space, the first thing they mentioned was the printer scene. And so I am debating about whether or not to uh, draw a little bit of a caricature based off that uh printer scene and if it's something that you're interested in let me know in the comments and uh, I'll see about whether or not uh, uh, there's enough interest in it to make sure that that gets done. So in our final stages here you'll see them kind of getting in that that line work to represent the piece of paper hanging on the uh, on the uh, cubicle wall there and then the rest of this is really just kind of solidifying the final lines for the background. Now you'll see them kind of overlapping into Lumberg's head and body and stuff like that but that's only because it's on its own layer. So it's, it's going to there's going to be some kind of overlapping lines here that don't seem to make sense when we get into the final version but I'm going to kind of get them out of the way here so we can kind of focus on the final figure at the end and we'll come back to that background when we get into the coloring area of this in part two of the video. So this about sums it up. Our final line work here is getting finished up with just a little bit of line work in the hair to represent some of the feathering that's in there. And we can kind of sign off on this today just by kind of saying that, you know, when it comes to this final line drawing, really it was just a matter of kind of like putting in some of the bold lines, figuring out where I wanted something to be, and then kind of going in with the eraser, erasing, and just redrawing until I got it right. You see a lot of evidence of this right now with that forearm. Even though I kind of have a, a, a method that I like when it comes to kind of getting the hand in first and then playing connect the dots, I did struggle with a little bit of the foreshortening of this forearm because of the shirt that was around it. 90 shirts, especially these dress shirts, tend to be very oversized. Uh, uh, the, the sleeves tended to poof up a little bit around the uh, around the wrist collar there. And so kind of getting it drawn in a way that looked a little bit poofy, but also somewhat natural and realistic, and at least anatomically correct, meant a lot of trial and error. And the funny thing is, is that when I finally settled on a final version of this where I'm happy, I'd actually kind of kept it on its own layer and went back to the original drawing 
you know, from a couple versions ago to see how much of a difference it was. And, and it really wasn't all that different. So, you know, it can be tempting to kind of get caught up on the details, but sometimes you have to kind of wonder whether or not it's going to be a productive use of your time. And in this case, I have to admit, it really wasn't. I ended up pretty much with the same thing I started with, but even though the time lapse doesn't really kind of indicate it here, I spent probably a good 45 minutes over two days trying to get the forearm sleeve to look the way that I wanted it to, only to kind of end it up with just the first version of it that I started with. Now, when I when I when we speak the first version of it, what I'm really talking about is just trying to paint in really really big bold lines without, you know, overthinking it. Um, I, do, I you know shaky line work is never something that looks very good unless you're going for that particular type of style. So, when I'm drawing in my line work, what I'm really trying to do is just take the natural the natural kind of swooping motion as as much as I can when I get this line work in. So, when I'm drawing in the arm, it's really with one big strong steady swoop that's really kind of fluid as much as I can. This is an example of me, you know, kind of drawing from the shoulder, not not from the wrist getting my whole arm involved and trying to get that line the way I want it to. And again, this is it goes back to the beauty of working in a digital media because the reality is, is that I can swoop that line through any way I want, but if it doesn't go exactly where I want it to, all I have to do is the uh, double finger tap on the screen, erase it and just draw that line again and do it over and over and over again until I get it exactly where I want. But because I'm using these long fluid motions, the drawing itself and the line work itself just looks a lot nicer, a lot cleaner and, and you know, my opinion, a lot more professional. And ultimately that's what I'm trying for is to get something that looks like a professionally rendered piece at the end of this. So having said that, you know, uh, uh, I'm drawing in that that section of the arm over and over and over again with a series of sweeping motions, going back and erasing, trying again, erasing, trying again, until I finally settle on something that I like. And again, we had the argument there about whether or not it was a good, you know, use of time, but the method itself is still a sound one. You know, the rest of this drawing was done in a similar fashion with big sweeping lines and just kind of erasing them and putting them back in until I was happy. And I don't consider it to be a waste of time to get a final, you know, product the way that I kind of see it right here. So that about sums up part one of the video. And just to give you a little bit of a preview, here is what our ending up piece is going to look like. Ah, oh, yeah, I'm going to need you to go ahead and subscribe. So please go ahead and do that if you uh, can take a moment. It really helps me out. And stay tuned. We'll have part two up here with the coloring and uh, light and shadow rendering pretty soon. In the meantime, take care and thanks for stopping by.